Dr. Sidney Berger's vast teaching career has spanned 55 years and is currently an adjunct professor at Simmons University and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, uh, their library schools. He was the director of the Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum, head of special collections and university archivist at the University of California, uh, Riverside, and the curator of printed books and curator of manuscripts at the American Antiquarian Society. He has published more than 20 books and 150 scholarly articles and lectured over 150 times on book-related and literary topics. Five of his books have been about papermaking, uh, and he has written the decorated paper column for hand papermaking, the periodical, a uh, hand papermaking newsletter for going on 17 years. His book, Rare Books and Special Collections, won the National ABC Clio American Library Association Award for the best book in library literature, and his Dictionary of the Book, a glossary for book collectors, booksellers, librarians, and others, will appear in its second expanded edition in 2022. His most recent publications are an article for the PBSA on the use of dandy rolls to create watermarks in the chapter on end leaves for the book Book Parts, published by the Oxford University Press. Sid edited the journal Rare Books and Manuscript for Librarianship. He has taught paper making. He has made papyrus amate, which is Mexican bark paper, and tapa cloth. And he gives workshops in hand casting and printing types and printing on the iron hand press. Dr. Berger's talk today is written in collaboration with Michelle Clunan. Dr. Clunan is dean and professor at the School of Library and Information Science at Simmons, where she is now dean and professor Emerita. She also was the chair, Department of Information Studies at UCLA, and a professor with specialties in preservation, book and publishing history, and other library science and book related areas. She began her career as a book conservator. She has published more than 10 books and scores of articles, and she has given more than 100 talks, most of which are on the preservation of library materials and the preservation of culture. Her book, The Monumental Chain Challenge of Preservation from MIT Press, won the University of Mary Washington Center for Historic Preservation Award for the best book in preservation. She was the editor of the journal Preservation, Digital Technology, and Culture for five years. Sid and Michelle are co-proprietors of the Doe Press, publishing short texts from handset type on handmade paper printed on the hand press. Everybody, please help me welcome Dr. Sid Berger. Hello, Sid. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Good to see you. Thanks for that lovely introduction. I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. Um, I'd like to thank Rob Fleck and Aaron Evans for their invitation to speak at this wonderful festival and to thank Charles Agvent and Jennifer Lee, who helped us gather information about the Limited Editions Club for this talk, and a warm shout out to Millie, too. And I'd like to remind you all that this is the work of Michelle Clunan and me, partners in the research and writing and in life. When Michelle and I worked on this presentation, we scoured the wide world of information and discovered things that I trust will be news to many of you. Eventually, our findings will appear in a book we're collaborating on, a revised and greatly expanded version of Michelle's book, Early Bindings in Paper. The first thing you see when you look at a book is its binding, yet it's often part of the book that is difficult to find information about. Even more elusive is information about the decorated papers used on a book's covers, the bluers or end sheets. Running parallel to this is that women artists have been even more invisible than men when they're both doing the same kind of work. We'll be looking at this phenomenon for this talk with a focus on the difficulty scholars have in identifying women decorated paper artists over the centuries. Books are complex forms of expression with many component parts they're created by people with distinct but complementary abilities. Artists, authors, designers, paper makers, printers, bookbinders, 
and decorated paper makers. Each part of the book is worth studying and each contributes to our knowledge of the history of books. One key point in looking at the various contributors to book manufacture is that while the names of authors, printers, paper makers, book designers, type designers, artists, book binders, and even spouses of some of these are often mentioned in colophons or acknowledgements, almost never do you find the name of the party who designed the decorated papers the book is bound in, the cover papers or the end sheets. It's as if these papers simply sprang to hand for the binder or book designer and their maker is unknown or not worth mentioning. And also with the presumption that the reader, the collector, the librarian, cataloger or bookseller is simply not interested. In many cases, this assumption may be true. Also, the binder may have gotten the decorated sheets ages ago acquired for their patterns or beauty, not because of their makers. And the identities of those makers may not even have been known to the distributors of the papers. So the binder herself may not know who created the decorated paper she's using because she kept no record of it when she got the paper or it was delivered with no information about its maker. This common situation indicates the level of respect that the paper's artists have gotten over the centuries. The attitude has been, why mention these artists? Who could be interested? It's bad enough that these artists have been relatively invisible over the centuries, but it's even worse for women whose recognition is even more suppressed. Today, there is a world of scholarship in which such information is indeed of interest. Our talk has two aims, to identify women in the book arts and also to identify the papers that they created. With a few notable exceptions, these women are often difficult to identify. They're not always mentioned in colophons or acknowledgements, and even when they are, if they got married and changed their names, they may have disappeared. We'll look at well-known women paper decorators as well as some whom we could find little information about. Some of the women we will consider were illustrators, book designers, book binders, or conservators, or they were amateurs. Four of them were well-known enough to be recognized for their work. Rosamund Loring, Nancy Storm, Delight Rushmore Lewis, and Veronica Ruzica. All of them play different roles in the book arts, but we've unearthed a few others worthy of note, but who have been practically unheard of despite their fine work. Decorated papers are part of the substance of bookbinding, but are mostly relegated to minor supporting roles. While colophons usually include the kind of information I've just mentioned, descriptions of bindings receive less attention and decorated papers are rarely mentioned at all, or they're improperly identified as we see in some of the book colophons and advertisements from the limited editions club in which paste papers are called marbled papers. As we've observed, Usually, we can learn but little about the history or manufacture of papers, but they are certainly worthy of close study. Before we discuss the women under consideration today, I'd like to give you an example of the general problems of identifying the makers of decorated papers. A distinctive paper was created specifically for the limited editions club. Whittier's book, Snowbound. It was designed by Carl Purrington Rollins and bound by the Boston Bookbinding Company. Every part of the book was designed to evoke snow and snowstorms. The medallion on the title page, as you see there, shows a New England winter scene. As the advertisement for the book notes, the cloth used on the spine has a pattern that suggests lightning, and the so-called fancy paper sides suggest snow. 
That's from the advertisement. But neither George Macy, owner of the Limited Editions Club, nor Carol Porter Grossman, who wrote the history of the club, identifies the paper decorator, though the paper, not the maker, is mentioned in the LEC newsletter. LEC, of course, Limited Editions Club. Even so meticulous a company as the LEC, with its extensive work on each volume and the careful descriptions of the book's production, usually neglects to mention paper decorators. And as we said, in the extensive corpus of volumes that they produced, the elaborate descriptive literature about these volumes is often flawed or silent in describing the papers. One cannot imagine a typeface being misidentified in LEC books. But when we see paste papers being called marbled, you know the publisher has been careless or ignorant. This is an indication that for some publishers, decorated papers were not seen as important components of the book. We know, however, that one important creator and scholar of decorated papers, Rosamund Loring, designed and produced papers for three LEC publications, the Brothers Karamazov, Christmas Carol, and Thoreau's Walden. The colophons of those books don't mention her. The scores of copies on the web also don't mention Loring in their book descriptions. One would think that such a prominent and important scholar and writer about her papers as Loring would be mentioned when someone with Loring's standing and reputation contributed her papers to a book, her name might have been, uh, it might have meant additional sales. So she's much more likely to be mentioned in a colophon than would be an equally talented paper decorator with no public recognition. So it's no wonder that women paper artists are fairly invisible in the book world. Because paste, paste papers are easier to create than are marbled, they were produced by any number of people in the book arts, binders, book conservators, printers, illustrators, designers, and so on. The women whom we are discussing today had a variety of backgrounds in arts and crafts. These papers are often difficult or impossible to trace to a particular artist. As early as the 18th century in the US, in Pennsylvania, the Moravians from Herrenhut, Saxony, Germany, were producing paste papers for bindings as they did in Germany. Distinctive characteristics of Herrenhutter papers are the binder's tools that were used as well as the decorative use of finger movements. And here's another decorative paper from the Herrenhutter community in Pennsylvania. As it is sometimes possible to trace tools to particular workshops that can, that can sometimes lead to identifying the makers of particular papers, or at least to binderies in which the papers were made, if not to particular people. This style was copied in the US by German American groups who printed and bound books in the older German styles. Here's another one. We know that in Germany, some of these paste papers were done by women. So though we have no specific names of the artists, it's probably a good assumption to believe that many from Pennsylvania were done by women who worked at various tasks in the binderies of the Moravian community. Marbling has gotten a good deal more attention than have paste papers. To condense a large body of information about the early uses of it in the United States, I'll summarize by saying that Richard Wolff discusses marbling by many people from the 1760s on, naming Benjamin Franklin and the members of the Mann family of Dedham, Massachusetts, among many others. When he talks about marbling being done by craftsmen, he's referring to the binderies advertising the art, and he does not distinguish the men from the women working in these establishments. 
Coincidentally, he mentions one member of the marbling community in the 18th century, bookseller, stationer, and bookbinder Josiah Loring, ancestor of the husband of one of the most important people to be discussed in this talk, Rosamund Loring. Michelle and I have had a long-standing interest in the creation of decorated papers with a strong interest in women's contributions. But as we said at the outset, it is often impossible to determine the makers of many, if not most, historical decorated papers. And this is true up through the 20th century. By the end of the 19th century, with tremendous technological advances in printing and color, Binders and others using decorated papers for literally thousands of other uses had available massive troves of commercial papers for their projects, so many to choose from that the decorators were even more hidden than ever before, and the makers of hand-produced papers were equally invisible. Marbling carried out throughout the last half of the 19th century uh, though much in the shadows and usually by bookbinders or for them. One practitioner, Jacob Cates, used these papers in his bookbinding, and Wolf mentions that after his death, his widow, Sarah Ann Cates, seems to have taken over his business, though whether she was a marbler is not clear. And when city directories actually mention bookbinderies, whether they offer marbled services or products or not. The businesses are always in the names of the men who started them, not giving credit for the others working there, especially the widows who have inherited those businesses. Hence, it's possible that family members or employees did marbling and will never know their names. Wolf does cite Mrs. Sarah Josepha Hale's book, Receipts for the Millions, an uh, 1857 publication, in which marbling is described, but there's no way to know whether Mrs. Hale herself was a marbler. Emily Pizar references several 19th century U.S. marblers, and she cites an 1852 article in Godey's Ladies Book, about a book bindery where marbling is being done. And she also references an article in the Christian Recorder of May 1895, which is titled Marbling Books, about the marbling of book edges. Bazaar reveals other references to marbling in 19th century America, but not a single woman is mentioned, despite the fact that the art was introduced to women in Godey's Ladies Book. In 1895, the Boston Herald published an anonymously presented article titled, Trying the Bookbinding Fad, Artistic Work for Feminine Hands. In this brief text, the use of marbled papers is mentioned, but nowhere does it mention how the women taking up binding should acquire or produce these papers. By the 1930s, with the publication of a few important volumes on marbling and other book arts, a new interest in marbling was born, often by relatively unknown artists. Marbling, in particular, was being practiced and taught in schools. Phoebe Easton, in her book um, on marbling, in a section titled Marbling for Classrooms and Recreation, says without giving dates, but she's referring to the time from the depression up through about 1950. Teachers introduced simple oil on water marbling in art classes for pupils ranging from elementary to high school grades. Marbling also began to appear as a craft for recreation. Many friends who were in elementary school in the 30s and later have spoken of their pleasure in classroom marbling, and some still have samples of their childhood efforts. Some of the teachers who pioneered in this field published the results of their marbling efforts of, in the classroom, reporting enthusiastically on its popularity and economy, an important factor in depression years. 
According to Edith Deal, from William Morris's Kelmscott Press books of the 1890s on, binders gave attention to creating decorated papers for their books. She identifies a few women who were active in the 30s and 40s. Mrs. Henry F. James, of course, Rosamund Loring, Janet Bullock, Jane Cox, Mrs. Thomas Shipman, Veronica Rizika, and Dorothy Moulton. Loring shows one of Moulton's papers in her book, but that is the only sample of her work that Michelle and I have been able to find. And we can find no information about her at all. This brief list of women also mentions two men. Even most men working at paper decoration were hidden by the scholars, printers, and publishers of the day. From Edith Deal and a few other sources, we've been able to identify a couple of other makers of decorated papers up through, say, about the middle of the 20th century, at which time the arts and crafts of paper decoration begin to explode in this country. Since discussing women's making of these papers in the US is our aim, we'd like to focus on the few women in the first half of the 20th century who had some impact on the craft, modest though that influence may have been in some cases. In the 1930s, um, in, the, uh, in the 1930 issue of the school arts magazine, Lila Togneri published a short piece titled, Another Way to Make Patterned Papers in the Schoolroom. It's clear that by the late 1920s, women were making decorated paper for classroom activities. Togneri discusses oil on water marbling for book binding, lampshades, box covers or box liners, gift wrap and envelope liners. At least with Lila Tugnery, we have a name, another woman paper artist, but we have been unable to find out too much about her. We learned that she got her master's degree in 1940, 10 years after she published her piece on marbling. And since her work had to do with teaching marbling, she cannot really be proven to be a regular practitioner of the craft, but she was spreading the word, if only for young kids. Further, we have no way of seeing any of the papers she produced, if she produced any, nor do we know of any of her students or other teachers or the influence she had on them in making such papers. And we don't know where she learned to marble or what influences she had that led to her writing to a mainly female audience, the school teachers who would be using the techniques she described. Michelle and I have also discovered N.S. Fertschild, who in Women's Wear Daily of February 1930, has a piece titled Maison Paul Poiré suggests old fashioned marbled paper in chiffons. A key issue here is that marbling of papers and of fabrics can be seen as related crafts, a phenomenon we see even more clearly in the world of wallpapers when the wall coverings and matching curtains yielded the same kind of paired crafts. The fur child piece predates Rosamund Loring's work by a few years. Another woman writing a full decade before Loring's, uh, Loring's decorated book papers was published is Gail Ball of East Cleveland, Ohio. She's the author of oops, Marbled Paper for Attractive Envelope Linings published in 1932, January 32. She too describes the oil on water method of marbling. Yet again, women decorated papers are in the shadows. Did Rosamund Loring know of them, read their work, get inspired by them? We'll probably never know. Loring herself never mentions them. And to cap off the notion that women were marbling but remained unknown, we see in the May 1945 
issue of Popular Ma uh, Mechanics magazine, an unsigned article on water float marble finish. It talks about producing imitation marble on glass, paper, metal, or wood using the oil on water technique. Though there's no author given, the image shown is a woman doing the marbling. One other person deserves to be resurrected and another name that does not make it into any research in the field, Jean Maxwell. In the March 1950 issue of the magazine, The American Home, Maxwell published a short piece titled, How to Marbleize a Lampshade, in which she describes the now recognizable method of oil on water marbling. The piece is quite short, only one column in this large format magazine. We don't learn too much that we don't already know, but one thing that is revealed is another woman spreading the word about marbling. But now we come to perhaps the most recognizable woman paper decorator of the first half of the 20th century, Rosamund Loring. She had an immense impact on the arts of paper decoration. She was a bookbinder and also a collector of and scholar studying decorated papers. Her predecessors mostly taught marbling to students. Their names are not familiar in the book world, but most of you will know Loring through the two important books she published, the 1933 book called Marbled Papers and then her magnum opus, Decorated Book Papers, being an account of their designs and fashions in 1942. Her paste papers were lovely. Oh, there's the book. Her paste papers were quite beautiful. These books were issued in limited editions of 149 and 250 copies, respectively, with the second and more comprehensive text reprinted three times so it exists in four editions and thousands of copies. Until the uh, publication of Phoebe Easton's book on marbling in 1983, that's 41 years later, the Loring text was the most thorough and, uh, uh, and comprehensive book on the subject. Um, it covers things beyond marbling with sections on block printed, Dutch gilt and paste papers, along with sections on publishers' end papers and pictorial end papers. Rosamund Bowditch Loring, in her day and beyond, was the Dean of American Historians and Practitioners of Decorated Papers and is the most senior of the women we're considering and certainly the best known. She became interested in decorated papers when she was studying bookbinding in Boston with Mary Crease Sears in 1920. Her enthusiasm revealed in her writing, lecturing and workshops almost single-handedly brought the arts of decorated papers to a broad audience in ways not done by her predecessors whom we've been discussing. She knew of marbling from having seen innumerable books with marbled papers on their covers and end sheets. She may have seen the work of Tugnery, Ball, and the others we have mentioned, but she never mentions them. She needed decorated papers for her own binding and apparently decided that if she could not buy good ones, she would make them herself. And she couldn't buy them because much of their production had disappeared in the US and Europe. Through the 19th century, marbled and paste papers were still being produced. But as I mentioned earlier, with the Industrial Revolution, most handcrafts either disappeared completely or they were replaced by some form of mechanization. Mechanically decorated and printed papers were available, but they lacked the beauty and the spirit along with the look and the feel of handcrafted decorated papers. So Loring did her research, reading what books she could find and pretty much brought marbling back from its grave. Though she was not a brilliant marbler and though she excelled to greater effect in paste papers, 
Her marbling was good, and the impact she had on the world of marbling was immense. Clients of hers included the Riverside Press, the Marybound Press, the Limited Editions Club, the Club of Odd Volumes, and others. Most of Loring's work was done for the Marymount Press from 1932 to 45. Three of these commissions were for the Limited Editions Club, as I mentioned, the Brothers Karamazov, in three volumes, each with a different color paper. So Loring had to produce 4,500 sheets. She refused to do such a large edition after that. She also did papers for Christmas Carol and Walden in the 1930s. As we said, she's not mentioned at all in those volumes, typical of the way women and most paper decorators were treated in the commercial and fine press publishing world. From Loring, we want to move on to her most celebrated student, Veronica Ruzica. Here's a slide of Veronica on the right and her sister Tatiana on the left. It's um, silhouettes created by her father, their father. Um, their father was uh, uh, Rudolf Ruzica. And Veronica was the best known of the American decorated paper makers in the first half of the 20th century. She learned how to make paste paper from Loring. And by the time she graduated from Barnard College in 1939, she was already making her Proteus papers as her correspondence shows. Her best known paper is the one her father designed that she turned into paste paper, the towers of Harvard College this slide shows the original mar uh, paste paper sheet in the Dartmouth College Veronica Ruzica collection. And there's a little note on it, which you can see not for sale, which means that the paper was proprietary. It was purchased by Harvard for their exclusive use. The paper was also used for the dust jacket of the first uh, uh, edition um, and uh, later editions of Loring's book, Decorated Book Papers. She produced a host of lovely patterns for her Proteus papers. And I'm just gonna run through a bunch of them here to show you the quality of her work. She was extremely skilled and she, did the drawings and she, she created the rollers herself for all of these patterns. Loring described Veronica Ruzica as one of her most successful uh, 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 pupils whose use of color and charm of design have made her an outstanding artist in this field, she says. Veronica was an accomplished artist and designer, so one cannot help but wonder what the actual division of labor was for the Harvard paper. Did Rudolph provide the sketches of the towers for which Veronica created the rubber stamps and wrapped them around a roller and cut and printed them? Did she or Rudolph decide on the placement of the towers and the color used? As Veronica created the designs and made the cuts for the designs of a number of other papers, she could have cut the towers as well. We'll never know who did what, but there is no doubt that Rudolph was the better recognized artist and perhaps for that reason was given a primary credit. The Veronica Rizika archive at Dartmouth is revelatory of her fame and the small circle in which she operated. There are many letters from bookbinders and printers, commercial and private presses, inquiring about the availability of her papers. And she even went so far as to produce an advertising brochure showing some of her papers and announcing that she was able to make them to order. There's the brochure.
And while her papers were often sought out and used by fine press and commercial publishers, she seldom mentioned in the volumes in which her papers were displayed or in the advertising material that came with those books. She is, however, credited in a few volumes. In Dard Hunter's book, Before Life Began, the colophon says, the cover paper was made by Veronica Ruzica. And here's the cover paper. But much more common is the type of files chapbook, An Evening with Ordnance, with the text by Beatrice Ward, covered in one of Veronica's lovely papers. But the colophon says nothing about her. On the other hand, in George Parker Winship's book, John Gutenberg, a lecture, the colophon notes that the book was, quote, bound in Proteus papers made by Veronica Ruzica. Veronica also created the paste papers for the limited editions club edition of Henry Fielding's The History of the Life of the Late Mr. Jonathan Wilde. And there's the cover of the paper that Veronica produced and the colophon that says nothing about her. She's not mentioned, but we know from correspondence that she decorated the papers. She should have been given credit in the colophon. Apparently, she didn't, in this, didn't uh, insist that her name be there, or if she did, there's no record of it in the correspondence. And that correspondence is pretty explicit from the publisher. It's impossible to know how many of her papers were used in books. In her correspondence files that we looked at are letters from various printers asking about her papers. For example, Carol Coleman from the Prairie Press and Mary Richmond from the Cummington Press, among others. But one would need to go through the works of these presses to see if her papers were used. More examples of her work may come to light, but if they do, and are not acknowledged in the colophons, one would need to recognize her patterns to make the attributions. She was low key in her own art world, though she was clearly quite influential. She's best known for her decorated papers and they survive as examples of paste papers at their finest. The next slide shows her beautiful paper for Thomas Buick engraver uh, by her father, Rudolph, a type of file chapbook done in 1943. Another of the few women paper decorators who are identifiable is Nancy Storm. She was born in 1908 in Cleveland, Ohio and attended Oberlin College where she met Colton Storm, whom she married in 1932. She transferred then to the Cleveland School of Art as is often the case with married couples, the man's career is seen as more important than that of his wife. So it is better recorded. We can find out little about Nancy Storm's life for much of the time they were married. However, it appears that she started making paste papers in Ann Arbor, Michigan around the early 1940s. The entry about her in Who's Who states, Manufacture of hand decorated paste papers for book bindings, believed to be the only professional manufacturer in the US. We can find nothing about where she learned to make these papers. And based on her husband's correspondence at the Newberry Library, she seems to have been self taught. By 1953, she was making sample books and selling her papers. She and Colton started a bindery in Sedona, Arizona. Nancy sold her bindery and equipment to Arizona State University in the late 1980s, and a small collection of her papers, including the ones I'm showing you now, wound up in their archives where these slides were taken. Not much is known about her as a professional artist though she too was an accomplished craftsperson.
I'll just go through these quickly. Wonderful papers. There's her uh, sample book that she did. That's gone one too far. Another identified paper decorator is Delight Rushmore Lewis, daughter of Arthur W. Rushmore, the proprietor of the Golden Hind Press, which was active from 1925 to 55. The press was known for its nearly 200 fairly small publications created by Arthur Rushmore. Some of these pieces were bound in papers covered uh, 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 excuse me, bound in paper covers designed by his daughter, Delight, a skilled paper artist, though she is better known as a ceramicist. It's telling that in three long paragraphs about the press, Roderick Cave, in his book on private presses, talks about the type the press had, the authors, the presses, uh, all kinds of things about what the press published, some of the titles they issued, and the fact that the Rushmore's children and grandchildren enjoyed many hours playing with type, but he does not give any names beyond Arthur's. He does mention the fact that the press was run by the Rushmore's, but he never mentions Delight or the papers she contributed to the bindings. James Fraser tells us much more. He discusses Arthur and his wife, Edna, and their work at the press with their daughter, Elaine, setting some of the type and working the press and delight adding the paste papers that were used on 11 bindings of books from the press. The Rushmores called them Fairview papers and they show a great degree of professionalism and originality. To reinforce the contention that women are seldom credited with the artistry they contributed to books, the ob obituary for Delight mentions only that she was a potter. She died in 2017, one month before her 105th birthday. And here are some of her papers. The 1937 volume, Bookmaking on the Distaff Side, does give credit where it's due. And that's the paper that was used for the end leaves in the book. And she is mentioned, of course. Delight Rushmore Lewis might have remained somewhat in the shadows had James H. Fraser not written his book, The Paste Papers of the Golden Hind Press in which he extols Delight's skills and shows a host of patterns she created. With that volume, Delight emerges from the shadows and we now have a tool with which we can identify books bearing her papers, even if she's not credited in those volumes. In doing the research for this presentation, we pulled a small book from our collection published by the Black Cat Press in 1934. It's titled, He is Nothing But a Little Boy, with a fine paste paper cover. In a rare occurrence, we were happy to discover that the Colophon identifies the paste paper as one Doris Trankner. Another Black Cat Press book, in a fairly ugly red paste paper, Robert Wirtz's Broken Chords, also identifies Doris Trankner as the maker of the paste paper. Try as we might, we were unable to find out anything about her. That her name appears in two Black Hat Press books of the 1930s is almost miraculous. Much more typical is the 1929 Eleanor Wiley book, Angels and Earthly Creatures, with an attractive paste paper on the cover but no mention of the paper artist, as is the case with innumerable such books. The Colophon 
of the type of files publication bombed but unbeaten has a nice decorated paper on the cover, but it mentions no paper artist. Phoebe Easton, drawing mostly from Rosamund Loring and Edith Deal, gives us the names of women whose marbling was excellent, as I mentioned before. They were Mrs. Thomas Shipton, Dorothy Moulton, Miss, Mrs. Georgia Bullock, Mrs. Irving Cox, and Mrs. Henry James, Henry F. James. All of this is provocative, but it's unsatisfying. Yes, women were marbling, but who were they? What were they doing with their marbling? Were they using the sheets on bindings or for other uses? Or were they just doing it for the fun of it? Where are their papers today? And for a few of them, what were their names? Mrs. Irving Cox, Mrs. Thomas H. Shipman, didn't they have identities of their own separate from their own, uh, from their, their husband's identities? So though we have the names and a few brief assessments of their work, that's about as far as our knowledge goes for these women. And we tried, but we couldn't find almost anything at all about them. In the Veronica Rizika archive at Dartmouth, we discovered a paper artist, Antoinette Jacobson, who was a friend of Veronica Rizika. So we contacted her, she's still alive. Jacobson gave us a good deal of information about Rizika. And we learned that she too was a paste paper artist. She produced reams of lovely papers, some of which were used for books or cards. Some of her papers were used and at least two books for the Basilisk Press. That's one of hers and another and another. And though she was working beyond the time of our present interests, she's worth mentioning since she learned from Veronica. So she exemplifies the kind of passing along of skills that we see from Loring on. One other person merits our attention with respect to decorated papers. A woman making not paste or marbling papers, but decorated papers of another kind. Here we have a remarkable survival, a paper sample book of decorated papers by one woman, Amy Drevenstedt, who published at least this one sample book of her papers, and she seems to be the purveyor of them as well. She was born in July 1886, and a couple of decades later, she was teaching drawing in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She became a fairly well-known book illustrator, working in the 1920s and 30s in the Art Deco style. She did the illustrations and cover designs for several books, and as did Veronica Rizika, she did maps for various published projects like the map of the flight of Charles A. Lindbergh from New York to Paris in 1927, a pictorial map of Connecticut that she did, and a detail of the peddler in another pictorial map. She was, a, she was quite serious about her papers and about protecting her designs. We found on the web an application for a patent for one of her works, a design for a box cover paper that she was doing for the department store John Wanamaker in New York. She filed the application in 1927 for this lovely paper. Um, she did greeting cards, gift enclosure cards, tissue papers, tablecloths, napkins, and trade cards, Christmas cards, and other paper products. An extensive advertising piece in the Atlantic Monthly in 1912 talks of all the ways her many papers can be used. Here are some of her papers, and we have quite a number of slides of them. We not only have the name, I love this one. I had a Scotty once. We not only have the name of the paper designer, but we have her selling her own papers. And we have a good many samples of her work. From the 18th to about the middle of the 20th century, 
Paper decorators, men and women, have been fairly neglected, but women have suffered more than men in this respect. We searched in archives, in oral histories, through correspondence, in magazines, on the web, through extensive emails sent to scholars, librarians, and bibliographers, paper artists, in the published, in many published volumes that we looked into, bibliographies, bindery records, fine press records, academic archives, and newsletters, and we conducted interviews on the phone and in person. The original 28 pages of this talk has been reduced for this presentation to a mere nine. The few names we've been able to come up with clearly indicate that a good deal more scholarship needs to be done to reveal the wealth of beautiful work women have done that has gone uncredited. They just need to be ferreted out as we have tried to do here. We trust this is only the beginning of such research. Thank you very much. Okay, Sid, thank you so much for that marvelous talk. Very informative um, and extremely helpful, which I think should be continued well into the future. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from some of our participants? Denise Brady says, thank you. Great to see those papers and hear these names. It was fun discovering. I should throw in just a little footnote. When we found the Black Cat Press books with um, uh, Doris uh, Frankner's name on it, we were astonished to find that several years later, the Black Cat Press had books with papers decorated by somebody named, no, uh, she was Frankner. Yeah. Frankner was later. Yeah, Doris Tra Frankner, a Doris Frankner. And we figured it was a typo, but it turns out probably, it probably was not a typo. It was another Doris with an Ankner at the end of her name. Another woman, but we know really nothing about her. Well, we don't know. We, we know <laughs> nothing we, about her. We rooted around quite a bit on that one, so we'll never know. Yeah. She lived to... Um, great old age too, so it's possible she could have done books for Black Cat in the 30s and in the 80s, but who knows. Oh, that's great. Um, good to see you, Michelle, by the way. Thank <laughs> you. Welcome, welcome to uh, the virtual Oak Knoll Fest. Um, th this is just such a complex uh, amount of research that you guys did. Uh, just out of curiosity, how, how much time did you spend putting this talk together? Oh, two or three hundred hours. <laughs> and we spent the summer on this, basically, but mm -hmm. our interests go way back. So for Veronica Ruzica, I first learned of her papers when I was studying bookbinding with Catherine Gerlach way back when, 40 years ago, and never knew anything about her, um, except that Posey told me she was um, Rudolph's daughter, which I think was a curse that she had to live with. Yeah, in some circles, my name is Michelle's husband. <laughs> And so she was, she was yeah, Rudolph's right. daughter. Daughter, right, whatever. <laughs> um, and then we can't prove this yet, but my mother had a book plate with a Scotty dog from her childhood. And we think it might be one of Amy uh, Drebin's dogs. Yeah. So we're gonna do some more work on that. So it just shows you, you know, how small in some ways the world of the book is. And more, more research needs to be continued. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Millie has it. Mildred Fleck, my mother in the owner of Oak Knoll. Uh, she Hi, Millie. <laughs> Did you notice anything in your studies that began to defer after women's suffrage? Good question. I don't think there's, there doesn't seem to be any connection between women's suffrage and the book arts that we were talking about. I, 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 I couldn't discern any. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's a though. good question, yeah. though. I, and that's another area of um, research that I think should be done, because after suffrage, women had not many more rights, but some. And it might have changed the, their trajectory in the book arts world, in the rest of the world. 
Yeah, I might be interested in looking at the Bloomsbury Group and Vanessa Bell and Virginia Woolf and see if anything was happening in London at that time. We focused on American artists, but um, it'd be interesting to look at that further. So to answer your question, Rob, it took us 45 years to write this <laughs> <Yeah>. paper. <laughs> Uh, Rebecca Johnson Melvin of the University of Delaware. Uh, she's, she says, quote, I'd like to share a link uh, to the Paulette Green paper collection at the University of Delaware, acquired, no surprise, from Oak Knoll. It's a great teaching collection to use for study of decorated papers, and she provides a link. We will provide that uh, when we edit the video uh, in the comments field when we <clears throat> on our YouTube channel. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, just as a footnote to that, Michelle and I put together a collection of decorated papers from about the 14th century through the 21st. It has 22,000 pieces in it with a heavy concentration on 18th and 19th and many 20th century papers. It's at Texas A&M University now, and they're digitizing the papers. And many of the papers, thousands of them, I think, are now available to, for viewing online from the Cushing Library at Texas A&M University. We stopped collecting decorated papers until the next day after Texas took our papers <laughs> from us. And now we have another thousand in our collection here. <laughs> this is his news. Uh, Jesse Erickson uh, says, do you know if any of the Drevenstedt's paper designs were intended and or marketed for scrapbooking and paper craft or were decorative yes. papers not being commercially produced for this purpose at this time? Um, I'm sure that they were produced for scrapbooking. Scrapbooks go back to the 19th century and even before oh, that, really, yeah. a, a lot before that. And she had a very wide vision when she was making her papers. They are definitely used in scrapbooking. No question about it. Uh, Jeff Peachy um, has a question, is, uh, or a comment, looks like. No, question. Um, from the description of your research, which seemed very comprehensive, what other sources of information would you recommend to discover more about women in other historically marginalized communities? It seemed like you ran into many dead ends. <laughs> I think that no matter what area of inquiry you enter, men and women, but mostly women, will not appear where they should appear. There will be dead ends in all areas. I tell you, we spent, I can't tell you how many hours trying to identify Trankner. Hours and hours on the web and libraries. And there is nothing about her out there. There's nothing. Yeah, I mean, we even, the Chicago Public Library has a big archive of Black Cat Press, and we talked to the curator there. And I wanted to find out more about Madeline Forg because she was part of the women in the distaff side and Norman Forg started Black Cat Press and she made paper, but even finding out about her, we wrote to her daughter and granddaughter and never heard back, which is another thing, you know, you can spread, <laughs> you can um, send notes to lots of people and maybe you'll hear back and, and maybe you won't. And then, of course, you know, when they when women marry and you, you don't have their first names, that's really makes it yeah, more who, difficult. Who is Mrs. Irving Cox? That's another <laughs> one. We could not find the first yeah. name for those women. We didn't even know their names. I mean, it's just it, it's it's yeah. appalling. We did try the the Guild of Book Workers, um, but they didn't start publishing a directory till the 1940s. And the person at Iowa was really helpful there, but we were only able to find a couple people there because it makes sense that paper decorators would you know could have been members of the guild. Um, Noel does have a question. Uh, what do you know about Iris Nevins? Oh, we know quite a bit. Iris is a wonderful, wonderful artist. In fact, I'm sitting right in front of one of her books here. <laughs> I mean, well, I would sort of say she's senior in the you know more contemporary we, world of paste papers. We sort of cut it off with um, Nancy Storm. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of work to be done with more contemporary paper. Decorators. This is one of her. <laughs> this is one of her beautiful papers, Iris Nevins, and uh, and she she did this great book on traditional marbling. 
with really excellent papers, beautiful yeah, papers that she has done. Her expertise, I mean, she does gorgeous papers. And one of the papers that we sent to Texas A&M was a, fl a, a marbled flower, which was spectacular. But um, she's really good at doing historical papers. So if you have a book from 1820 that originally had marbled papers on it, and it's so damaged, you can't see the pattern practically anymore. She can reproduce those old patterns and she's got the colors down perfectly. And she's a, a brilliant marbler, just brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. Richard does have a question about Drevenstedt's book. Uh, I am going to ask if he can join us. Let me go back to it. Oops. Is it on the screen for everybody? No. Oh, it isn't. Oh, okay. Yankee peddler. Oh, the Yankee peddler image? Yes. Yeah, they... There you are. Yeah. I wondered. It says down at the bottom, yes, we have no nutmegs. When was this book published? This was not a book. This was a map. Oh, a map. Okay. When was it published? You know? Yeah, this the map was about 1932 or something like oh, that. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah, right because, around that era. Because there was a song, as you know. Uh, yes, we have no bananas, and it's just yeah. a funny combination of words that happen to appear in these two different contexts. Sure. It started in 1923 by somebody named Billy Jones, and I just wondered if there was any kind of a tonight. It just seemed just a curiosity. Right. Yeah, I, I think it was 1935 when that map was done. Okay. Was so a, a detail from the map. Okay, it's uh, thank you very much. There's no way of knowing it. it. Look, I just thought it was fun. Thank you so much. Sure. You know, the question, um, and Iris Nevins brought something else to mind. Said, so can you hold this up? Yeah. Carol Blinn, who's a wonderful paste paper designer, did a book for the limited editions club in 1981, and she is included in the Colophon. But it took a lot of years for that to happen. And this is the uh, slipcase, the slipcase. Yeah. Which is it's the bridge, so it's the bridge over water. So you've got the image of water here in her paste paper. I absolutely love that book. I find it so beautiful. It yeah. is, but you know that's way after the period that we talked about here. And we acquired it from that. I can't remember the name of the bookseller. They're in. Uh, uh, they're in Delaware. <laughs> oh yeah, it was Oaknall. Oh, it was Oaknall that where we got this book. Yeah. Where we got about. I'm happy to. We're happy to provide it. <laughs> yeah, we have about a thousand books in our collection from Oaknall, in, including um, one called Traditional Marbling. <laughs> yep. Well, uh, just uh, if anybody has any more questions, just doing one last final check here. Uh, so I think that would conclude our, uh, our Q and A forum. So, uh, um, and I would like to, on behalf of, you know, Oak Knoll, as well as everybody watching this, thank you, uh, Sid and Michelle, thank you so much for putting this together. It was spectacular, spectacular, uh, talk. I can't, it's just so much research that you put into it. I think we're all set, but thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you.